welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Depending on one's disposition, the beauty or frustration of building relationships involves two types of ingredients, one which is completely in our power and the other one that is absolutely not in our power. For example, for those ingredients that are definitely within our power, for example, our, our, our thoughts, our behaviors, our willingness to take risk, to invest, to trust It's refreshing to know that we have the capacity to really help or hinder, if we choose wrongly, a relationship based on our actions, our choices. That's huge. But those that are not in our control, much like Mother Nature, are unpredictable. Hard to understand, yet simple sometimes to explain in hindsight. Because... While we can be true to ourselves as well as be our best selves, we don't know if the people we encounter on any given day will be a breath of sunshine or a bolt of lightning. We just don't know. We have no control over that. Even if it is going to work and seeing the same people every day, we still don't know the other variables that bring other people into our lives. However, as social beings, we need some level of interaction. Now, some will need more if you're more on the extroverted side, and some will need less if you're more introverted, like myself. But we do need others to some capacity if we want to become or allow ourselves to be our best selves, our fullest selves, to reach our full potential. One of the pillars of a simply luxurious life, which I spoke about actually in the first episode of the Simple Sophisticate podcast, is this idea that we need healthy, strong relationships. We need to establish and foster healthy relationships. And I'll leave a link to that first podcast on today's show notes. Um, So if you want to go back and listen, you're welcome to. So today, what, what I would like to dive into is this idea of how to do that, how to build strong, healthy relationships, beginning with your friendships and most definitely your romantic partnerships, as well as the relationships you build at work and in your community, the necessity of having social connections that bring with it trust, kindness, loyalty, and a sense of security and peace of mind are invaluable as we go about our daily routines, pursue our goals, attempt risk, and thoroughly enjoy life. But there is a value in knowing how to do this in our everyday lives. I mean, surely we can go and and be blind about it and do whatever comes naturally. But more often than not, if you do that, as you go through life, or you haven't had a model, I guess you could say, if you haven't had someone to model how to positively interact and cultivate relationships, there may be moments where you're kicking yourself after the fact. I've been there. I'm speaking from experience. So I by no means am perfect at this, but this is how we learn, right? This is how we learn. So today I wanted to dive into specifically the key components for building strong, healthy relationships. We're going to go over seven today and we're going to have a primary, primarily we're going to focus on that significant other, that relationship. But in all honesty, all of these, these components, these seven components we're going to talk about will only help to build relationships no matter what they are in your life, whether it's at work or with your friends or whatnot. All right, so let's get started. The first component in building healthy, strong relationships is to cultivate a healthy self-esteem. So this isn't even involving that other person yet. This is just about you. You have got to build a strong foundation first. If you indeed want to be in a healthy relationship, you yourself have to be healthy in mind and body, but mainly in mind in this case, because really what we think, what we feel, we project out into the world. And if we think negatively about ourselves, we will track that negativity back towards a simple concept, 
more difficult to act or, or to behave in such a way with, if we don't have the self-esteem that we need. So in 2011, I actually wrote a, a blog post about the difference between self-esteem and self-worth. And I'll, I'll share a link to it on today's show notes. But it was this concept, this idea that we are all born with self-worth. We is in the moment we are born, we have value. We are of value. We are a human on this earth. We definitely are of, of, of a substance or an in, a person who deserves and, and needs to be treated as a valuable entity. It's us to do, figure that out. We need to figure that out and accept that truth. But it is true immediately when we are born. The difference, though, between self-worth and self-esteem is that self-esteem is something that we don't instantly have. We have to cultivate that. We have to build that. So what exactly is self-esteem then? Well, let's really quickly review that, and then I'll dive into why this ties into building healthy relationships. Since self-esteem is simply confidence in one's own worth and abilities, in essence, our self-respect, we need to then go out and get to know ourselves. We need to go out and try things and find what our talents are, our passions are, foster those, build those become more of who we are or want to be or have always been destined to be if that's what we believe. But we have to find that within ourselves. No one can give that to us. No one can give that to us. This is the Jerry Maguire, you complete me. No, 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 not going to happen. I'm not saying two people can't come together and form an even better union than they were apart, but you have got to be complete and whole and have a sense of self-worth about you or realize your self-worth and then build that self-esteem so that you can be that healthy individual in a partnership. Why is self-esteem important for building relationships? You might be wondering, well, because without it, the relationship wanders into that nasty codependency area. The jealousy starts to erupt and no longer are you bettering each other. You no longer help. You're not, you're, it's not a better place to be in that relationship. You're actually hurting or hindering each other. And it's not a healthy place to be. And that is not something that I, I, we can't assume that the first relationship we have, we're going to have this self, this high self-esteem. We're constantly growing. So we cannot beat ourselves up about past oopses or why wasn't I? Because we're most likely all going to do those things. But what we can do is say, oh, that's right. That's why I was behaving that way. Or oh, that's right. I wasn't really sure of who I was. And just by doing that self-examination, reflection, we learn, we grow. And that's how we can evolve. And even if we're still in that same relationship, we can help our relationship to grow as well. So that's number one, cultivate a healthy self-esteem. Number two is to be selfless. And I want to start number two by sharing you this quote, which I also have included um, on the show notes. Uh, it begins, quote, relationships aren't forgetting things. They're forgiving things. Never fall in love to make yourself happy. Fall in love to make the person you fall in love with happy. Now, there is, I want to recognize or point out that there is a conscious balance that must be struck when we choose to be selfless. Selfless doesn't mean disappearing so that your partner can shine. It doesn't mean that your dreams, your needs, your desires no longer matter and you put them on a shelf. But what it does mean is that when you give of yourself, of your time and your heart, you aren't doing it to, to get something in return. For example, when you decide to give your partner a gift, whether an actual material gift or an experience or, or, or time together, whatever it is, it is something that they will love, use, or have dreamt about, even if you don't understand it or, 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 or you know, it won't be something that you get to enjoy with them. It's because you know it will make them happy. Giving and being selfless is doing so without expecting anything in return, except to make their day brighter, better, and more enjoyable. So you see, by doing that, you're not you're not short shortchanging yourself. You're not saying I'm not important. I'm I, you know you're not forgetting about yourself. What you're doing is it's not even about you. It's about them. You're being thoughtful. You're being aware of who they are. You're saying I love you. I care about you. I want to make your day better. And it's not about what am I going to get in return by giving you that gift? What are you going to give me because I gave you that? No, 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 no. That's the wrong purpose for giving any gift. All right. So number two is be selfless. Number three is to accept the natural pace. With friends or, or partners or neighbors, anyone 
anyone we meet is not, or most likely is not going to have their, the same pacing of in life as we do, how they go about anything. They, they may take longer to open up. They may be really quick to open up depending on their personality or how they were raised or their experiences. And even that their pacing may shift over time as they experience new things in life. All right. Simply because your rela- your last relationship reached the I love you stage in six months, but yet ended after eight months, doesn't mean that your next relationship will follow the same path. And, and we shouldn't expect it to because there are two different people. There's a different combination there. You are a different person too, if you've learned and grown from the last experience, and they definitely are going to be a different person. So we can't expect the pacing to number one, be the same as what it's been in the past in any circumstance, or to go at a pace that we want it to go at. When, when we allow the relationship to unfold naturally, taking note of opportunities when they arise without being forced or manipulated, and enjoying those opportunities, seeing them for what they are. They're opportunities. Take advantage of them. Enjoy them. That is when we know the speed we are traveling is just right. Another part of knowing that the proper speed is being followed is being observant, simply listening, communicating clearly. When we do these three things, so many obstacles, so many obstacles and questions are removed. And most importantly, when we do that communicating, when we allow things to travel naturally, and we aren't manipulating, the game playing goes out the window. And there, wow, it can be, it can be frightening to, to not put up a game or, or think that, to realize that a game isn't necessary because it means that we have to be vulnerable. We have to be honest. We have to be our true selves. We have to show them who we are. But that's when the magic starts happening. Gradually at its own pace, that is when the magic starts happening and people start realizing this person's for real. This person's really showing me who they are, whether it's at work or play or with friends or with your, with your significant other, that's when they realize this is a connection. And that's when you also realize if that person is in it for that reason, um, as well, this is a time to, again, be observant, observe how the other person is handling this as well. And that's number three. All right. Number four is to accumulate moments. I love this one. (laughs) I love this one. Part of the reason I like this one is when you accumulate moments then you can replay them back in your mind when you're not with that person or when you're not, um, when you're just having a whole drum kind of day or you're doing something you have to do, but you don't really want to do. Anyway, that's part of the reason I like this one, but let's get into it. Whether these moments are unexpected or planned, ordinary or monumental, simple or grand, We need to revel in these moments, be present, put our cell phones down, stop checking our email and lose track of time with those people we have chosen to be with. Moments like these help cultivate a sincere relationship because they require our full attention. And it, again, can be intimidating and scary to do that because it's like, okay, I'm, I might say something wrong. I might do something silly. That's what's going to create a moment that is going to be the natural unfolding of those events. And this is where we just have to kind of trust. And that's frightening, I know. But by giving our full attention, we are letting that person know they matter. And when they know they matter, or they can feel that or sense that, they're more likely, if they're in the same same place as you are, at least, at least they're willing to invest they're willing, they may be willing to open up a little bit more too, or be more vulnerable. And that's again, when those connections continue to be made and to be built. And that's when that strength of that relationship grows. So number four is accumulate moments. Enjoy that one. You guys, it's always a good one. All right. We've just gone over the first four ways to build a strong and healthy relationship. Before I dive into the final three, I'm going to take a quick one minute intermission and I will see you on the other side.
All right. Well, welcome back. We are now going to dive into the final three components of building strong and healthy relationships. And number five is a tough one. Number five is be vulnerable, be vulnerable. And I have to speak, say, I, I, and be honest here, this one is really difficult for me. And I have a feeling it's probably difficult for a lot of people. Uh, it's not easy to open yourself up if you know you could get hurt, especially, especially when you have been hurt in the past. And if you come from a place where you people that you've been invested with have hurt you or taken that, that trust and um, used it either against you or just didn't, weren't considerate about things, you're definitely more cognizant of the pain that could be felt when you go and move forward and you're less likely to drop that wall or be vulnerable. So as someone who has been hurt in the past, we carry those memories as a means to protect ourselves, which is smart. That's natural and that's perfectly normal. But while this knowledge and lack of ignorance of what could happen is valuable to a point, it can also be the wall we put up, as I was saying before, as a way of find, it's the wall that gets in the way of us having or creating those relationships that could be what we're looking for in the first place. And I know that's like, well, ugh, this is going to be frustrating then because how am I going to know? And da, da, da. I, I get it. I, I get it. The last handful of years, I have basically just thrown myself into work and I loved every minute of it. But part of it was just, I didn't want to have my heart broken. And I think I'm not, I don't think I'm an anomaly here based on conversations that I've had, but at the same time, there's only one way to connect with people. And that is to be vulnerable. That is to be vulnerable. If we want to establish sincere relationships and connections with others in any capacity, we have to be able to put our true selves out there. And it's not that we're putting out there them ourselves out there to be judged. We're putting ourselves out there to see if someone else wishes to connect. And there are people out there that will not everyone. And you wouldn't want everyone to connect with you. So, I mean, that's the other thing. So just keep that in mind. While we should by no, by no means be opening up to everyone we meet, as I just said, what we can do, what we can do is observe those people that we do interact with, be very cognizant of that, begin to wade slowly when we think we have encountered people that could potentially be good colleagues or confidants or friends and so on and so forth. And we just go gradually and we see how they respond to those little drops of ourselves that we put out there. Because from Brene Brown's book, which I highly recommend as a resource to have, um, Daring Greatly, she reminds us that the only way to truly connect with others is to show them who you are. Gradually, you're doing this gradually, but you are going to have to do it with a little bit of uh, guarded, but blind faith. So that's a huge component in building healthy, strong relationships. You've got to get to know that person, but the only way to let them trust you to open up is if you open up to them. So it's a two way street. It's back and forth, back and forth. And that's number five. Number six is live in the real world, but don't be limited by precedence. Okay. So in a recent post by Mark and Angel Hack Life, and I actually posted it on this past week's This and That, and I'll provide a link to it on the show notes. They speak to the ways that one can eliminate jealousy from their relationships. And one, actually two of the ways that um, they talked about was number one, stop comparing yourself to others, as well as stop letting your imagination run wild into those negative territories where you freak yourself out. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. At least I know I've done that. So Due to all of this, so this is where I want you to get back into the real world, live in the real world. Due to all of the Hollywood love stories that are projected in theaters and have been for decades, the reality television shows that are anything but reality, and even the books we read, we forget that all of these entities are produced, scripted, and have a purpose to keep viewers interested and tuning in. We have to always remember that. You can enjoy watching them. I'm not saying that, but just look at it through a critical lens. We must remind ourselves that in the real world, there are no time lapses that bypass those everyday routines and lives and, and things that we have to do. And by keeping our imagination in check, we must stop assuming the worst simply because someone is, for example, hey, they're running late or they forgot to pick up something and they said that they would. People are people. They're human. 
and we can't jump to conclusions. The real world is full of many mundane moments. Let's just be honest. But if we realize this, the extraordinary moments will happen much more often. And, and we are going to be far better situated to thoroughly enjoy them. And keeping that in mind, so keeping that in mind, we accept that there are some, some humdrum days. Nothing bad's going on. Nothing fabulous is going on that you want to tape and share with the world. But it's good. It's still all right. It's okay. It's, it's, it's life. That's the real world. But also, I want to dive into the second part of number six, which is don't be limited by precedence, simply because the love story of your parents, grandparents, or your best friend took a certain path, and you just think it's magical, and they seem blissfully happy, doesn't mean your love story is going to look the same. It'll probably be different. It most likely will be different, but it doesn't mean that you can't find that same feeling or connection that you see with them. No love story is the same because no two people are the same and no two circumstances are the same. Every, there's so many different variables. There's so many different variables. I want to share with you a quote that I found just recently, and it talks about that whole concept of love and how we find it, but also the component of how we make it last or how we cultivate it and make it something that, that we are continually wanting to be a part of. So here we go. Quote, no one falls in love by choice. It is by chance. No one stays in love by chance. It is work. And no one falls out of love by chance. It is choice. Once you heed these two principles of living in the real world, but not being limited by precedence, allow yourself to submit to love when it does arrive. Because you you really, as much as we would love to plan for it to arrive on such and such birthday or by such and such birthday, if we do actually make that deadline, we have to wonder, did we manipulate this? Did we force this? Is this real? Always just allow it to happen. Be observant. Be aware. Be honest with yourself. But be willing to embrace it or submit to it when it does arrive, even if it's unexpected. When we realize that it is a choice to continue to give ourselves to that love once we're in it, that is huge. If we're aware of the formula of the choice versus chance, it will be the most rewarding work of our life. This commitment, this investment into that relationship, which is why I want to share this next quote, which I just think, you know, they say love is, is work. Relationships are work. And I'm not denying that fact whatsoever. Um, as that quote that I previously shared testifies to, but keep this one in mind too. Quote, fall in love with someone that doesn't make you think love is hard. So sure, you're going to have to work a little here and there, obviously. But, but. All right, I'll just leave you with that thought. I know it's kind of open-ended, but I'll leave you with that thought. All right, last but not least, and I think this is one of the most, is probably the most important one in building strong, healthy relationships in any arena of our lives, but primarily in our, our with our significant other, is practice kindness. Number seven is practice kindness. I should say practice kindness regularly or every day or by default, always default to kindness because it is that important. I was recently listening to an interview on NPR of a man who was asked what he felt was the key to his lifelong romance with his wife of more than a few decades. And while he began by saying that real love must exist in order for that relationship to last, he continued to define what real love was to him. And he said at its core, real love is all about kindness, kindness above all else, being thoughtful, being gentle with your words, not using any means to punish or be passive aggressive to punish. Kindness comes in how we communicate, even when it's tough to do so. Kindness comes in simple gestures throughout the day to help, to acknowledge or express adoration. Kindness is being selfless, as we stated earlier, and paying attention to the lives of those you care about, helping them reach their dreams, helping them have a better day. Sometimes, yes, this is a tricky one. Kindness means being truthful and giving honest feedback when it may not be easy to hear. But it is how we give this feedback in such times 
that will communicate the love that we generally feel. By no means, guys, so that's number seven, be kind. I, I mean, it, we could go on with examples and every, every person is going to be expressing different acts of kindness based on the people they're with, based on who they are, based on the circumstances of the situation, all sorts of things. And only you can know what you can do or what's best. And if you don't know, try. You cannot go wrong with kindness. Even if someone laughs in your face, they're the fool, not you. Be kind. So and I, I wanted to end on that one just because I think it's so powerful and just in, to make your life better, just in general, whether there's a, whether it's a, just a random run into a stranger, be kind. You just never know who's observing or you just never, never know. It's not a bad thing to put that out there. So as we wrap up, by no means, I want to, I want to, by no means are relationships easy. I don't want us to think that they are. Um, but part of the reason they're not easy is because there's no definite roadmap. Your roadmap is going to be different than my roadmap and so on and so forth. Each will take its own course, which at times, as I said at this beginning, is going to be frustrating initially. But when we understand that two unique individuals are coming together, it only makes sense that we're going to have different roadmaps. It only makes sense. When we choose to take those risks, though, of being vulnerable, of trusting others, we eventually find that life becomes tremendously sweeter. Even if from time to time, yes, we do bite into a bad apple. (laughs) It will happen and it will make the sweet apples all the better, right? However, it has been my experience that those bad apples give me or have given me invaluable wisdom on how to do it better next time. I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. And please feel free to email me or comment on today's blog post to share your experience or to add a question. And I will be do my best to answer. If you're interested in today's show notes, you can find them at the blog, www.thesimplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 11. And I'll also provide other posts that tie in with this topic as well. Now stay tuned for a fall sweet treat um, that I have a feeling you will most certainly want to enjoy year round in this week's Petit Plaisir. All right, welcome back. This week's Petit Pleasure is a cookie, and I I am not a typical per- cookie eater. Actually, I am a cookie eater. That's the whole issue. I need to limit myself from cookies, but if I'm going to eat a cookie, it's going to be a darn good cookie, and for fall in our family when we were kids, one of the cookies my mom would always pull out, and she only made it in fall, so it was always one of those. It's kind of like the Starbucks um, red cups or the pumpkin spice latte. It only came out for that season, and then you anticipated it all year, and then it was gone, so you look forward to it all the more. Anyway. And that's exactly what this cookie is like in our family. It is a pumpkin chip cookie or pumpkin chocolate chip cookie to be exact. And it is good. It is good. So I'll give you the recipe here and I'll make sure that it's posted up on the show notes. So backslash podcast 11 um, at the blog, the simply luxurious life.com backslash podcast 11. And I have a feeling that your family, your friends, you will enjoy it as well. So with pumpkin chocolate chip cookies, you're going to start off by creaming a half a cup of butter, unsalted butter, half a cup of unsalted butter, and one and a half cups of sugar. So you're going to cream them together until they're light and fluffy. Then just beat in one medium-sized egg, one cup of cooked or canned pumpkin, and drop in one teaspoon of vanilla. So that's in the blender or that's with the mixer going. And then in a separate bowl, mix and sift together the flour, which is going to be two and a half cups of flour, all purpose. You're going to add to the dry ingredients one teaspoon of baking soda, as well as one teaspoon of baking powder. Add in a half a teaspoon of salt. And this is where the flavor comes in. One teaspoon of nutmeg and one teaspoon of cinnamon. So you have those dry ingredients, sift them all together and then add them to the wet mixture that's already been mixed up with the, with the beater, the mixer, the blender. Add, if you want nuts, add a half a cup of dry roasted almonds chopped up. And then you've got to add the one cup of chocolate chips. And I recommend Ghirardelli chocolate chips or just the 
top quality chocolate chips will just make it so much better. I prefer milk chocolate ones in my cookies, but you can obviously choose whatever you prefer, whatever your predilection. Mix those together, mix all those ingredients together. And then on a baking sheet lined with parchment paper, either using a spoon or um, an ice cream scoop to size, go ahead and put drops of the cookie. I usually put nine to 12 drops on each baking sheet and bake it for 350, excuse me, bake it at 350 degrees for 15 minutes, that's all, or until lightly browned. And they're gonna be a little gooey on the inside um, if you do it right, but not too gooey. Uh, I wouldn't make bars out of them because it just never turned out right. I've tried that once. Um, it's just a little lighter consistency. It's not as dense, but trust me, these are really good. And they're really good, as you know, with most cookies out of the oven, out of the oven, warm and gooey. So I do hope you enjoy. If you like a little more pumpkin in your holiday festivities, these are a great cookie to eat and cook and enjoy. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each Monday's podcast, where I'll recommend a book, a film, a recipe, or from time to time, introduce you to an expert who offers insight into how to live simply luxuriously. Anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast. For more ideas and inspiration, stop by the blog, the Simply Luxurious Life.com, or subscribe to the weekly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox every Friday to help you stay caught up on the most recent podcasts and blog posts. Until next Monday, bonjour!